The following podcast is a Super Network production and spin-off of the King Zone podcast with the King Zones Book Club podcast, hosted by Super Marcy. Growing up, I kind of always saw myself as the main character. And Stephen T. Boltz. Yeah, no, I do love this book. I really do. It contains adult themes. The way that there are these coming-of-age themes when you're on the cusp of becoming a teenager. Coarse language. So I would have been one of the crucified ones. And potential spoilers. Spoiler alert. Prepare to take a deep dive into the literary works of Stephen King with us. Enjoy the show. Hello and welcome to the King Zones spin-off podcast with the King Zones book club podcast. This is our debut episode. I am your host, Super Marcy, and joining me for this King literary journey is my co-host and friend, Stephen T. Boltz. Hello, how are you? Hello, I'm well. Yeah, I'm good. Very good, very good. We are uh, we are here to talk Stephen King, but in a different way that I do with Bead on the King Zone podcast, because we are going to be mainly focusing on the short stories of Stephen King, and we'll throw in the occasional novella or novel, and I believe we're going to try to cover two stories per episode once a month or so, if I'm right. Yeah, yeah, I, uh, uh, I think that sounds good. That sounds good. And I can talk Stephen King for days, honestly, so this is, this is a perfect platform. I've been waiting for something like this since I was 12, so. Well, you're you're welcome, twelve year old. Uh, <laughs> uh, as we as we do in the King Zone, it is like a deep dive into the film or TV series adaptations or miniseries. <sighs> this is a kind of deep dive into the actual stories. We're not going to compare to any adaptations of it. We're just going to focus on the actual story. So it is quite different from the King Zone, and we'll be talking about things that haven't been adapted, or you know, all sorts of things. I'm very excited. I might add. <laughs> yeah, this is this is this is going to be good. The short stories don't get uh, don't get enough love. I think people are often, you know, they they think of King and they think of the novels, or they think of the short stories that have been adapted to film, often quite liberally, actually. Um, Children of the Corn, uh, mm-hmm. for for one, you know. So yeah, things like that, things like that. Going back and looking at the the short stories that don't get don't see uh, as much uh, fandom, I think. Yeah, I think so. And so I guess we have our own histories with Stephen King. For me, a lot of the short stories we'll be covering I have not read whereas you have actually read them so it'll be very interesting two completely different perspectives on podcast especially for this one because I had not read either of the stories oh, so wow. it'll be very interesting well, that's and, excellent. yeah and I guess we kind of decided to, to well I've actually been planning to do the spin-off podcast for a while to focus more on the the stories or novels or novellas without going into the adaptations that themselves which is a focus of the other podcast and as we were talking kind of thought yeah okay let's actually cover some short stories and do this with some you know actual frequency like once a month to complement in a way the other show so you know I can actually have a reason not that I need a reason but these (laughs) days I might need a reason to actually read more Stephen King and discover the short story so it's a good reading exercise for me and who better to do it with than someone who knows Stephen King, well, Stephen King's works very, very well than you. So that is pretty much the basis for this show to give everybody listening a bit of history and explanation so you know what you'll be getting into. For our two stories to talk about today, I believe this was your idea. So you can kind of explain your thoughts on, I guess, starting with these two. Oh, well, look, it started, we were going to do three, we were going to pick three stories from Nightshare. Mm-hmm. We'd had uh, trucks was one. Um, help me out. I think we had trucks, maybe lawnmower man. Trucks, lawnmower man, and some third thing. I can't remember what it was. As we were discussing it further, I thought it would be fun to read uh, to discuss the story Weeds uh, mm-hmm. that was filmed in Creepshow as the Lonesome Death of Jordy Barrel. But then I thought, 
wouldn't it be even more fun to put the lawnmower man and weeds together and sort of do a themed show? Yeah. So we decided to hold off on the lawnmower man, but then the theme idea mm. started percolating. And Jerusalem's Lot and One for the Road are both uh, both stories from Night Shift, from the collection Night Shift, but they're both, they both have really strong ties to King's uh, second novel, Salem's Lot. I uh, pitched this idea, thought, let's, let's try. Now, the themes are going to be um, pretty strong in the beginning and I think as we continue they're going to be a little more a little more tenuous and uh, might might not be themed after <laughs> after a little while but um, yeah I think this is a good one to start with yes it got me very excited and as I have not read Salem's Lot so there's something I do want to actually read but kind of knowing the story in its basics in the adaptation you know the films you know them yes because yeah and we did cover those for the King Zone so it's a bit more fresh in my memory I find a Salem's Lot quite a fascinating idea, like King's take on a Dracula kind of thing. And I guess even just knowing that he wrote more based around this, I found very interesting. So when you pitched this, I was like, yeah, let's look at uh, Jerusalem's Lot and One for the Road. And these are both, I believe, collected in Night Shift. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. Jer- Jerusalem's Lot is the first story in the collection. It was actually written when King was in college, but it wasn't published anywhere until until 1978 in Night Shift. It did get a reprint uh, later. The illustrated edition of, of Salem's Lot that came out in 2006, Jerusalem's Lot was published in, in that, as well as One for the Road. So there's a little Salem's Lot compendium for you if you just want to grab everything at once. Mm, I actually need to own a proper, nice, beautiful copy of Night Shift, which I'll get one day. Oh, my goodness. Oh, my <laughs> I have, my problem is I have no room to store things and they they just keep piling up. Yeah, that's the tragedy, isn't it? It That's the worst. Yeah. Yeah. Jerusalem's Lot is a short story and prequel to Salem's Lot. I'm going to pull you up there, Marcy. Yes. <laughs> I'm Please. not so – well, look, I think I'm not so sure it's a prequel. Like, we, mm. we, we've we got it, you know, grouped, and obviously Salem's Lot came mm-hmm. from, from this story, but I I see it as more like an alternate universe mm. version okay. of Salem's Lot because it's set in the 1800s. The basis mm-hmm. for the, the Booth family goes back to the, the 1700s, hundreds and they're vampires there already in Salem's lot they the vampires show up with Mr. Barlow and Mr. Mm-hmm. you know Mr. Straker when they come to town the evil has always been there mm-hmm. with Hubie Marston you know the bootlegging the Marston house and, and all that sort of stuff so Salem's lot has always had a uh, sort of like it's possible that it's a prequel but I don't mm. see the vampires coming in in like the 17 1800s mm. then fucking off to parts unknown waiting for Hubie Marston to come in and then Mr. Mm. Barlow you know, mm. it's an interesting story, but I think more than a prequel, it's like a springboard to Salem mm. Lot, right? Like it started started the idea and then he just spun it out to this, mm. you know. Jerusalem's Lot is very much a, it's very much an H.P. Lovecraft story. Yes. Very much. The um, It draws from a couple of different stories jumped out at me. The, uh, the Rats in the Walls, obviously, mm. was a big one. The Haunter mm-hmm. of the Dark and the idea of blood calling to blood is the shadow over Innsmouth. Right. So that's well, that's very much uh, Lovecrafty. You mentioned it before. Salem's Lot is, you know, Dracula. Salem's Mm. Lot is just Dracula meets Peyton Place, Mm. you know, for the most part. And Jerusalem's Lot, I know we don't want to go into a great synopsis, but, I, I, you know, for people who haven't read it, mm-hmm. it's a series of letters from a, a gentleman, Charles Boone, who has just moved into uh, an ancestral home. And the people in the surrounding township of Preacher's Corners, they they fear him. They say that uh, anyone who lives in Chapelwaite, the, the name of the house, anyone who lives in Chapelwaite must either be mad or run the risk of being coming so right mm. so his whole family just has this history and the story is him learning the history of his family and then ironically going insane sorry not going insane but seemingly mm-hmm. going insane because he finds out it's all true yes you know which is fantastic and it's got this um it kind of borders on cosmic horror um mm. where lovecraft has the necronomicon right there's the book in in jerusalem's lot is called uh de vermis mysterious or mysteries 
Um, I'm not sure how yeah. that's pronounced with the double I at the end. It's the mystery of the worm. Yeah. And, yeah. And the worm is like in my head, I don't know what you know about Lovecraft, but all I could see was a giant dole, which is a, you know, huge worm creature from his myth- mythos. So it's very closely tied to Lovecraft. Uh, at one point, Charles refers to the church. He and his manservant, Calvin, they go to the nearby town of Jerusalem's lot, which is all, you know, run down and, and, yeah. and basically just deserted. Yeah. And he there, fight, really. they find this church, they find this awful mm. church, and he refers to it as a place where the milk of the mm-hmm. cosmos has become sour and rancid. And I couldn't think of anything more Lovecraft than that. Than yeah, that. I, I had a lot of Lovecraft running through my head while I was <laughs> reading it. And as you mentioned with the rat, that reminded me of that story, which I haven't read for quite some time, but it just, I was in the back of my mind, it was there. And then I, I think when I was re- like the Mysteries of the Worm and and this and that, I was, because I had watched, can't think of the title, the Ken Russell movie with the Worm Woman, the, the Lair of the Worm Woman or something. Oh. Lair, Lair of the White Worm. Lair of the yeah, White that, Worm. That's yeah. it. Yeah. I could not think of what it was called. And yeah, because that was more recent. I, was, I had visions of that movie with the, with the mysteries of the worm. Oh, no doubt. For some reason. It was <laughs> yeah, just no like doubt. that movie in the really insane scenes as I'm reading bits of this. I'm like, okay, that's interesting. This was another one where, and again, not unlike Salem's Lot, you know, Ben Mears comes to town and he's just not trusted mm. by people right yeah. even though he was i mean he, he's from salem's lot he's a local he's a local yes. boy but he came back after so long and people just looking at him like hmm what you know mm. and that's what you have here with um charles boone people just don't trust him based on his family connection yeah. so there there are thematic ties uh, mm. b- uh between this and salem's lot quite a few i loved about the story and it's really just king's writing that i'm going to fawn over right now but the characters that they reference in this. So Charles is writing letters to his friend Bones. Bones. He, he yeah. writes to his friend Richard now and again. Mm. But they mention people that we they just drop names. We don't know these people. They have really nothing to do with the story. But uh, he, he mentions Mr. Calhoun, our long-winded friend, Mr. Calhoun. He mentions Hanson in England on another of his confounded jaunts. And um, Mr. Clary, who held a fundraiser for the cause. No, we don't know any of these people. We don't know what the cause is. No. <laughs> we don't know their cause. We don't know we don't know what Hansen is doing in England, except that he's consistently, you know, globe trotting. I love this stuff, this world building that he does with literally one sentence, mm. right? Mm. It doesn't make you feel isolated, you know, like who are these people and why are you talking about them? It actually brings you further into the world. Like it makes mm. you feel, it made me feel anyway, more comfortable with Charles Boone and listening to him and going, oh, okay, yeah, I get. You know, mm. I know where you're coming from. I know I I don't know who these people are, but you're speaking so casually about them. I feel like I know Boone a little better. Mm. What I liked about this was, I guess, going into it and not knowing what it was at all. Uh, just kind of knowing the time frame it was set. And that the story is told with letters and diary entries. Like so Dracula. I actually, yeah, I actually really liked that because I wasn't expecting it. But then I really liked how we read what Charles Boone has been writing. And then at the same time, what Calvin has put into like his journal or diary. Oh, his and how it, yeah. Is, yeah, and how different, like they're describing the same kind of events, but you see it from those two different perspectives. And I really liked that because it makes you question i guess your narrator a lot absolutely and it gets more it just builds up over i guess over the pages where it does culminate in this very big just well okay kind of ending and then like this editor's (laughs) note at the end and i was like well damn uh (laughs) it's only well i think it's like 20 ish pages but i'm like i could have had 200 pages because i was quite intrigued by the whole it is and and um what you mentioned there about boone being an unreliable sort of an unreliable narrator. He uh, he brings this up in the beginning, you know. He says something about perhaps suffering from the brain fever that took him when his mm. when his wife died, yeah. right? So he sets it up that he's already had episodes, mm. right? So when we read Cal's journal, Calvin is saying that, oh, he fears that Mr. Boone has fallen back into, into the madness. So when they get to um, they get to the church for the second time, this the the worm, I guess, the big worm, sort of bursts out of the floor, mm. right? Kills 
poor Calvin, right? Hi, and Calvin. um oh Cal, he was so good. <laughs> and so he um Boone is is writing all of this to Bones. And the fella at the end who is in present day who has collected all of these mm. letters because he now has inherited chapel weight, he's been back to Jerusalem's lot. The church is there, but the floorboard everything's fine. There's no evidence of a gigantic worm having burst through anything. <laughs> the place is deserted, he says, yes. But so that, again, makes you wonder, what was Charles Boone witnessing this or was he insane, right? Yeah. But at the same time, this new guy, he hears noises mm. in the walls just as Charles did. So already now you're like, oh, wait a minute. Is Charles yeah. Which and we haven't mentioned this at all. The link with the um, the Nosferatu, all the the links, but the link here from Salem's Lot should be vampires, and that's honest to God the least mm. interesting part of this story. Isn't it, it it is actually talk about the uh, talk about the vampire connection. I'll let you do that. I've been going on forever. You have no. <laughs> <laughs> I kid, I kid. I am absolutely fascinated listening to you talk. So yeah, just going back to that like end bit with the same like oh. The, the place needs uh, the exterminator. There are huge rats in the walls. Like, I liked that whole thing. And it makes you question, like, oh, so maybe he wasn't insane? Maybe the place just makes you insane. But there was, uh, i got to try and think back to the story. There was a whole thing where there was a, it was like an encrypted uh, diary. Oh, the yes. Book thing. And Calvin, I think, deciphers it. And then they find the Nosferatu. To, I think it's hidden behind the walls in the cellar. They go into the basement, mm -hmm. and that's where his cousin hanged himself mm. after his daughter had, you know, died in an accident yeah. on the stairs. And the chair is still there. When they go down, the chair and the rope are still there. It's still there, yeah. Right? And that's when the cousin and the daughter come out from behind the, the wall uh, as, the, as the undead, yeah. Yeah, that's one thing I guess I distinctly remember because uh, one of the characters' name was Marcella, which yes. is, you know, my name, <laughs> yes. if, if you pronounced it differently. Uh, <laughs> meanwhile, but that's something that struck to me as kind of very uh, Salem's Lot-ish with those undead kind of breaking through. So we know that there's some kind of undead force around. But I think, was there some kind of like witchcraft stuff thrown in there somewhere? Well, that's the, that's the, the book. You yeah. Know? So less witchcraft and just um, occultish, you know? Yeah. But it's it was his would it be his great great grandfather? It was like a uh, James Boone or might have yeah James Boone Boone who he started the whole he founded Jerusalem's lot he started this whole church his brother he got his brother Philip into it Philip is the one who then found the book for them mm, right and the stuff with the book yeah, yeah all, there, my brain's all muddled thing. but yeah, yeah. <laughs> and um the the whole town of Jerusalem's lot was like inbred and mm. and and horrible. In the end, at the church, Charles sees James, who could had to be like 140 years old by this point. Yeah. He's still there. He's still living there. So it, it just continues, like the line continues. And uh, that comes back, blood calling to blood, which is the, mm. you know, the, the, the big Lovecraft connection there. Yeah, because they have the Robert Diary, I think, where they learn all of this stuff with the, the inbred occult stuff. And I think there's something like a curse upon upon yeah. the place and stuff the, the, the like curse. that the so townspeople it, think of it yeah. as a curse yeah. 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 It's um it's a lot happens in 20 pages and it's really interesting like it and the way it's written especially for me going back to something that's you know more written to when it is set it's like I got to reread passages to really take it in and there's like so many interesting visuals like they the, the weird church with the obscene uh things that they see and inverted crosses there's things like this that I remember but then how it all ties in it's like wait I got to read that again. <laughs> <laughs> I'll tell you what. I used to have a um I used to have an audiobook collection of of Night Shift and Skeleton Crew. It wasn't all of the stories. It was just there were like five stories um or five tapes in each one so there's maybe, you know, 7 to 10 stories. And Jerusalem's Lot was one of them. But I've got I listen to audiobooks 
when I go to sleep, mm. like to this day. So from, from the time I was like 14 or so, I've been listening to audiobooks because the slightest noise in the house will wake me up and I won't, I, or not even let me get to sleep. But with an audiobook, my brain can sort of latch onto that and then I'm out and it's good, right? So I've been listening to these Stephen King audios for, you know, all 30, 35 years, right? Mm. And Jerusalem's Lot was one that I listened to quite often, quite often, but I'd only hear the first 10 minutes. And then you'd be minutes, asleep. Right. So I was like, now I've read the story and I have listened to it, you know, top to bottom, but I haven't read it in so long that I did forget so much of what was happening because like, like I said, you know, I knew the beginning very well and I knew how it ended, but everything in the middle, there is just so much, so much happening in here, so much going on. And um, I, I mean, I'll be completely honest with you. I forgot about the uh, Nosferatu in the basement. Yeah. Totally forgot about them because I'm thinking about the, the, uh, the, you know, the, the giant worm and the abandoned uh, yeah. church and the, the little town and everything. Yeah, I totally forgot about the... Because um... I, I, I was thinking, like, there there are, like, a va- there's a vampire thing in here somewhere, right? <laughs> right? And that's the thing I remember, because I I think the one of those in the basement was called Marcella. Mm-hmm, I'm mm-hmm. assuming yeah, it would have been Marcella, yeah, but yeah. yeah. And that's how I remember things, because my name <laughs> is never anywhere. But for someone who hadn't read this story up until, obviously, to prep for this podcast, and I went through it twice, and so much does happen that I'm, I've struggled to kind of put all the pieces together and it's like wait did this happen then or did that happen then I don't quite remember <laughs> and then I'm like wait chapel waits like the house and remembering all the little bits and pieces it's definitely something I kind of want to read again <laughs> because it, yeah. it does give you those really interesting visuals and so much weird stuff happens and really feeling that Lovecraft connection as well yeah, yeah. even though I haven't read Lovecraft for quite some time it was still very much there and and kind of noticeable so it's um it's very bizarre but i liked it and uh, it's something i definitely recommend people who haven't read it or perhaps have seen chapelweight the yeah. tv series to go and actually read this short story i don't know because i haven't seen it yet we will cover that separately but <laughs> i have nothing to compare it to at the point of reading it so it's go. absolutely fascinating really fascinating yeah and this story is a good it's a good um it's a good intro to lovecraft i mean it's a great primer mm-hmm. if um you don't want to jump right I, I, I caution people not to jump right into lovecraft mm. because he's he, his writing so dense it's so dense mm. i actually think it was stephen king who who said that Lovecraft wasn't a great writer, but a, a, an incredible world builder. Mm. Don't quote me quoting him on mm. that. I think it was mm. Stephen King. I can't be sure. But it's it's true. Lovecraft's very, the language he uses and, and the words he uses, you, you, sometimes you have to look some of this stuff up. Yeah, you know? right. <laughs> and so it's a, you don't want to, you don't want to dive, you don't want to dive right into Lovecraft. And this one, so Lovecraftian, you know, it's a nice little springboard. Like it gets you in, it gets you in there. Mm. And King's done that with, uh, there's some other uh, more themed uh, episodes for us perhaps, but there's like yeah. Crouch End is very Lovecrafty. His story N about the giant rock formations, very cosmic, cosmic horror, that sort of thing. So mm. yeah, I do. I, I love this story. This is one um, I kind of, my, my mind goes back to quite a bit. When I think of some of the best King, Jerusalem's Lot is right up there. Yeah. And in doing, you know, a little bit of research and looking up certain things I can just find about Jerusalem's Lot, uh, a few things have quoted as saying one of his best short stories and having read it, like, damn, it is damn fun. Fine, damn fine piece of literary fiction. <laughs> or is it fiction? Maybe he knows something we don't know. <laughs> he said one time of, of the stand, like people people come up to him and tell him, you know, that the stand is, is their favorite book. And and of course the stand is like forty years old, right? So he he doesn't feel great about that. He doesn't feel, you know, it's like I have written some things in between. For something that he wrote in college mm. to still be looked at as one of his greatest stories. I mean, I'm sure that's that's bittersweet as well. That's gotta be very bittersweet. You gotta hand it to the guy writing something so good in college. Like, can I even write something that good now? Probably not. Who knows? That son of a bitch. Yeah, yeah, exactly. He made that deal with the devil before I could for that talent, (laughs) damn it. (laughs) All right, let's move on to One for the Road. Of course, it is another short story in Night Shift, and it is a story that is narrated in the first person by Booth, and he talks about events that take place during a snowstorm neighbouring Jerusalem's lot, and the events take place, I think, one or two years after what happened in Salem's lot? Two years, yeah. 
Yeah, they mentioned it's been uh, it, it burned out two years ago. Mm. They said, yeah. yeah. So uh, again, this was one um, I hadn't read. I didn't really know what it was until you brought it up. So I looked <laughs> it up, and I'm like, okay, so it takes place after Salem's Lot. Let's do this. What a very different story this is. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and this one a proper sequel. Like yes. a completely proper sequel. Um, it does mention Marston House. Mm-hmm. Mentions certain specific uh, um, areas, you know, that that we know from the from the novel from Salem's Lot. It's very different in tone as well, because like you mentioned, this one's narrated in first person by by this guy Booth. And when we were talking about Jerusalem's Lot, I'm I'm going back in my head now, being afraid that I've called Boone Booth a time or two because of the um, because yeah. of the closeness of the yeah. <laughs> the even I was getting confused when I was reading one for the road. I'm like, wait, this isn't the same guy. Oh, no, it says Booth. <laughs> it's Booth, right? So this is Booth talking about a night that he spent in the bar at uh, Tukey's Bar, his friend um, Herb Tuklander, where this guy just sort of bursts into the bar in the middle of the snowstorm. He had left his family uh, in the car. They had gone off on a road that had not been plowed. And he walked this six miles you know, back into town. And now he's he's asking for help. The beautiful thing about this story, and, and Marcy, you know I'm a structure monkey. Like structure is my, structure is my thing. So I'm looking at the structure of this. And you feel bad for this guy at first, mm. you know? Like, oh, my wife, my daughter, you know, oh, they're out in this. It's like, oh, no. But he gets snippy with, right? Yes. Um, with Tukey. <laughs> he just gets snippy with him. And you're like, oh, well, this guy. And Tukey already has a has a, a low opinion of this guy because he knows he's not a local. He figures he's from New York, right? Something. Yeah. Turns out to be from New Jersey. And Booth thinks to himself, the only uh, thing worse than a, a fool from New York is a fool from, 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 New, from New, New Jersey. Jersey. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. So it, it that's great because you don't care so much that this guy, the, about the fate that this guy meets in the end mm. because he kind of eh, you don't want to say he deserves it but look you know he he was kind of a jerk about these people offering him help he was he was and it does kind of turn you against him a little bit and then you totally understand the frustrations of Toki and Booth mm. whereas uh, you kind of think he's like yeah I might have just thrown him out <laughs> <laughs> Go find your family and your car that's running out of gas. <laughs> we know what goes on in these parts near Jerusalem's lot. <laughs> and that's, yeah, and that's it. And they're being like they're being fairly cagey about it. Mm. So at the same time, yeah, this guy Lumley, his name is uh, Gerard Lumley. So he, he, you know, when he bursts in and he's he's a little confused and he's you know, but when he says six miles, they look at each other like they already know. Booth, um, Booth and Tukey, they already know. They're like, oh, did you say six months? They know how mm. far away Salem's are. They know what's going on here. Yeah. And But they're not very forthcoming about it. Mm. Largely because how can you be forthcoming about a town that's infested with vampires? Exactly. And we know <laughs> that's what's happened. <laughs> so they're being cagey about it. And Lumley's getting getting annoyed with He's them. So shitty. he is being quite snappish. <laughs> But, you know, so they're like, okay, look, we'll go out. We'll get the, you know, we'll help you. Um, Tukey says, all right, look, we'll get, we'll hop in my truck. I've got a truck with, you know, and we'll go. And again, Lumley's like, well, why didn't you mention this? Why did we spend 10 minutes, you know, talking about this? And mm, you really, (laughs) yeah, like you said, it's like, all right, well, go find him yourself. Yeah. Go find him yourself. But um, what it does, like, it just gives it to us. It kind of drip feeds it Mm. to us. Like, if we don't know Salem's Lot, which that'd be a great sort of um, experiment control thing i would say but you know the you know the movie you know enough about the movie to mm. to be familiar to get the references in this yeah stuff. like someone who hasn't seen it who hasn't read the book doesn't know anything the story still works on its own just as it, a i just can as see a that short. too yeah i can see that too because it's kind of contained and whatever you need to know about what it's kind of alluding to it's already kind of there and you don't necessarily need that and then when they kind of do go out in the snowstorm like while you know what they're gonna kind of see it's more of a surprise probably if you don't know that it's like vampires yeah he, trying to get out. <laughs> he brings up he brings up vampires pretty early on booth does he's like well, i only heard the word vampires mentioned once and that's mm. when they give this backstory about richie messina a, a couple years previous this guy richie messina who again and this is this world building that that king does he just mentions people like mm. we're supposed to know who they are. Mm. The Richie Messina story, who was a truck driver, was quite drunk one night 
and said, look, you are all so afraid of Salem's lot. I'll tell you what's up there. It's a pack of wild dogs. That's it, right? And he says, for $80, I'll go spend the night in Salem's mm. lot. And I, I, I'd love to know where King came up with $80, because that seems like a really specific sum of money. Like, I think Richie needed $80 to pay, like, a phone bill or something like that. Like, there's something bizarre about $80. Yeah, you know? Right. Fifty dollars, a hundred dollars. dollars. Great. Cool. Eighty dollars for eighty dollars. He's going to go up there and nobody, nobody in the bar, is, you know, takes him up on it. But he goes anyway. He goes because, anyway. <laughs> <laughs> so you're like, how bad did you need the 80 bucks, Richie? But he goes, he takes off. And uh, Lamont Henry, again, just a just a, a name drop from out of nowhere. Lamont Henry says that's the last time we're going to see yeah. Richie Messina. And it is. And it's and this it little this little vignette drop. <laughs> in the middle of this short story uh, is just fantastic. It's just a beautiful little thing. It's like a little story within a story about a story that we already we already know. It's like one of, one of those Russian nesting dolls. Yes. <laughs> I'd almost forgotten there was that bit in there till you mentioned it. And I'm like, oh, yeah, that's right. And and that line where it's like, well, no one's going to see him again. Yeah. And, and you're kind of sitting there going, yep, yeah, no shit, they're not. <laughs> <laughs> and... You know, as this kind of can, like, you know, the the third act of the story where they're actually in the the snowstorm, they're trying to find the car, and where's you know this guy's Lumley's uh, wife and daughter. But we kind of know what's probably happened to them. But it's the the reveal of them as I guess the undead, as specifically the little girl and how Booth sees that and how that ends up haunting him for so long. It's I think that's so well well written, and I was not expecting that to kind of happen either. And I, I can imagine it would have been some kind of horrific sight that you know he recounts this and remembers it. It I remembers think. it as as vividly as he as he does too. And w- once they get there, they get to the car, and you know Lumley was worried that they were going to run out of gas because they had the heat mm. going. Yeah. And it's still running. It's still running. He throws the door open, but. His wife and daughter are gone, right? So he goes running out into the snow and he's looking for him and then Booth and Tukey run after him. But he finds his wife and she, you know, she's already, she's vampire. She's vampire. Mm. She takes care of him. So Tukey and, um, Tukey and Booth run back to the, the truck and that's where the little girl is. And Booth is ready to pick her up. He's ready. He's he's mesmerized. He's he's yeah. already half gone. When um, Tuki throws a fucking Bible at her, just yes. nailed her with a. <laughs> he throws a fucking Bible <laughs> to save the day. He hooked a Bible <laughs> at a little girl, which is an image yes. that I can't get out of my head. And yep, saves saves Booth and everything. But you're right. It does. It ends. It ends in a way that you don't expect it ending. Which is which is not to say that there's no no closure but and yes it's an open ended sort of thing mm. because things are still happening in Salem's lot but the last line is so haunting about this little girl being out there still waiting for you know still waiting mm. for her her um goodnight kiss yeah wow you know it's not as you said not quite what you expect no from this you know not quite the way you think this is going to go it's very haunting to just end like that and you can kind of look at that as you know so kind of like themes of missing missing p- people when people go missing around like highways and whatnot and things in in that general area you can look at it like that and things about in that regard that's kind of how I saw it is like you know I guess people go missing but do, do, you know is there so much in Is it worth looking for people who are missing? If they met this weird end, do people just not care enough to look for missing Mm. people? This is what it was making me think about. And uh, I think that's like the power of, I guess, the, the written word of Stephen King. I was not expecting to think about these things, but I was. I'm mean, sitting here going, wow, I'm like all these people who go missing, whether they wanted to or not, and who's going to find them? But also, if there is a place that you know is condemned, just don't go there. Don't go anywhere don't go there. near there. <laughs> just, just say, you know, see well, a place he was from Jerusalem's lot. Don't go there. Salem's he lot. He was don't from go New there. Jersey. <laughs> he was from New Jersey. And they do bring this up. Like Booth even brings this up about people who've just gone missing. You know, mm. Richie Messina's wife figured that he moved to Florida. Yeah. You know, he just picked up and off to Florida, left her. And um, nobody really tugs too hard at that thread because mm. of the specter of of Salem's Lot. And they mention that, you know, that, yeah, people just went missing in Salem's Lot. They don't, they don't go too deeply into that. It's almost you know? a nonchalant about it. Mm-hmm. 
which yeah. just really it really makes you think as well. Which is even creepier. Yeah, but just yeah, if you if you see a place that looks like Salem's Lot or whichever, just don't go there. There's, it's infested with vampires. They will haunt you or turn you or kill you or something. I believe in um, <laughs> in Pet Cemetery when Rachel is coming back from Chicago, driving, you know, going back to the house there in the in the third act, she passes a sign for Jerusalem's Lot and thinks about how beautiful and haunting a name that is, you know, spend a night in Jerusalem's Lot. And she, you know, she goes past, she doesn't take the exit, but it it's drawing her in. Now, Rachel's got her own issues. Rachel's got her own problems to, you know, to take care of at home. But it, it is, it's that powerful that just driving past that sign sort of like, oh, makes her want to, makes yeah. her want to take that left, you know, take that yeah. turn. Yeah. Although things may have worked out just as bad for her if she did take that turn, so. <laughs> yeah, it really is six of one, half a dozen for the other for Rachel there. <laughs> oh, geez. But it's, um, it's very interesting that, you know, these two things that kind of focus, I guess, the central thing is like with Salem's lot, but we're going back to something else. But then we go forward to something else. It's actually very interesting in how reading these back to back form a very interesting kind of story without having that kind of in between thing. Yeah. And not really having read the in between thing, that these still work really well with you know, not even as much context as maybe I needed to, but it still just plays out really well. No, absolutely. You're absolutely right. right. Uh, One for the Road could be a sequel to Jerusalem's Lot. It could follow on from that. Absolutely. Mm. Without, uh, you know, without mm. the novel, without the novel in between. Um, there was, um, in in sort of re- researching this, someone, someone questioned why Marston House and not Chapelweight. Like there was already this evil house mm. in the Jerusalem's Lot short story. And this is why I said in, in the beginning of that discussion that I kind of feel that uh, Salem's Lot is an alternate an alternate universe version of the Jerusalem's Lot story. It could have been this way, but it, it, it sort of went another way at mm. a certain point. And that's why I said it was a springboard. But using, mm. you know, what you're saying, there's absolutely no – um, there, there's, there's absolutely no saying that this, this place in, in One for the Road is not that Jerusalem's lot. If you pull mm. the novel out, anything could have gone on in the hundred or so years in between. Yeah, them. I mean, what actually happened to Chapelway? Yes, yes. It I like just, to think that Marston House was built on the, um, yeah, okay, on I think the ruins. Maybe, maybe it would just turned that way over time. <laughs> There's like a loose kind of weird connection that's not written anywhere. It's just how we think yeah. of it. Yeah. But I guess that's kind of what King may have done is sprinkle those little seeds there that we, you know, kind of join the dots ourselves. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It, yeah. Um, and and, yeah. and if you if you follow down that rabbit hole, you will find many people who have connected those dots. Yeah. In in, in weird and fascinating ways. <laughs> there is there is a lot to connect in the in the Stephen King <laughs> um, you know, universe because obviously the, some of the same characters show up, same locations, all sorts of things. Some Somehow everything's connected in one weird way, in the weirdest alternate universe, the King. And that's, that's all, that's all <laughs> gunslinger stuff, the different universes, <laughs> all of that, all of that sort of stuff. So all of the, everything we just discussed is c- quite possible in that, yes. um, in that universe, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. And I was is. <laughs> just looking at these characters. I don't know if you've ever seen Castle Rock. Not yet. It is on the list. Look, I'll tell you what, without spoilers, I was so disappointed in Castle Rock because of the characters they chose to use. But they used Alan Pangborn, which makes complete sense. They used Sheriff Alan Pangborn from um, from Needful Things. Um, But some characters like there's a there's a girl in the first season called Jackie Torrent. Right. And her name's not even Jackie. She just took that because her uncle Jack and I'm like, oh, fuck, what is what does The Shining have to do with Castle Rock? Like nothing. Mm, right. Mm, and mm. the second season is actually set in Jerusalem's lot. I kind of vampires, but mm, mm. more or less, you know, just resurrected dead sort of thing happening. But also they use Annie Wilkes mm. to draw a really tenuous connection here. And I'm thinking 
where are characters like Lamont Henry and Billy Larrabee? And, you know, where was Tukey's bar? You know, mm. where, where was this stuff? Where was um, fucking in um, Mrs. Todd's Shortcut, which is another one that we so got to do. I love Mrs. Todd's Shortcut. Um, these two, these two guys, like these, these sort of, unknown characters from the short stories still in in inhabit this universe and castle rock said now we're going to do misery I'm like fuck you guys you know it was so bad because going back and looking at these these short stories there's a there's a whole universe of characters here that just goes goes completely un, unused and yeah you know unappreciated and that's what we were talking about before yeah and i think that's kind of you know part of this podcast is we'll be talking about you know very interesting different characters that don't often get mentioned or brought up in you know something like castle rock yeah certainly and you know i think and it's a it's a very different experience as well reading to watching obviously (laughs) and you know this gives us a chance to really just focus on the written word and actually really appreciate you know all these little things like gerard Jared? Gerard, 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 Gerard Lumley. Lumley being a bit of a dick, uh, you know, a bit through the story, <laughs> things like that. It's it's very very interesting. Um, I keep saying interesting, and it's not the word I want. It's intriguing, intriguing. maybe. It's uh definitely it's been a very interesting ride with all, yeah. with these two short stories, and I'm very excited to dive into more in the near future when we yeah. uh, continue on with the show. I was going to say the same thing. I'm, I'm excited to see where we where we go with this. And also very excited for you to read Salem's Lot. Yes, I will have to do that. <laughs> Please. We will we will come back um, in a few months when I've read it and we'll talk about the book. Okay, very good. Very good. <laughs> we will throw the occasional book or novella in, in there somewhere, but we are going to focus more on the short stories. But yeah, I think um, I actually really enjoyed both Jerusalem's Lot and One for the Road. If I were to give them ratings out of five, I, I would probably sit on a solid like four and a half out of five for both because I think they're that good. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. Very, I, I go five and four. Five mm. and four. I think they're, yeah, I think they're great. And, you know, I can't fault Jerusalem's lot at all. Not mm. at all. And one for the road is it's just as good, but different. the same but different. Yeah, yeah. Same but different. That's, that's yeah. what I really liked ab- about both of them. And yeah, thank you for pairing these together and coming up with you know what we're doing for our debut episode. Oh, no worries. No worries. And, uh, See what else we can uh, come yeah. up with. And, uh, we already have planned what we're going to do for episode two, I believe. Yes. That's yes. in the bag already. So tell <laughs> our listeners what they can look forward to. Next we week. are going to be looking. We are going to be looking at actually what's what started the whole pairing off anyway yeah. was the lawnmower man and weeds. Uh, again, you might be familiar with Lawnmower Man from the the um, the movie that actually King took his name off. Yeah, because it was so unconnected to his short story. And Weeds was filmed in Creepshow. Uh, it's the story that Stephen King starred in mm. because, according to him, he gives good idiot. He's not wrong. He does. <laughs> He's great as uh, as Jordy Barrel. Jordy Barrel's wonderful, wonderful. So I'm yes. Uh, There it is. Lawnmower Man and Weeds. Very, very excited for those two. We'll be back for episode two, hopefully uh, in a month or so. Yeah, we thank people for listening to us ramble about Stephen King. (laughs) Two short stories for for this episode, but I found it very enjoyable. Hopefully I'll be able to get my words out better as I progress. It's been a, it's been, it's been a, I've been podcasting for 12 years. I Half the time, I don't know what I'm doing, but we'll... You'll get it soon. You'll get we'll, it. I'll it, work it out soon. It'll hit you. It'll <laughs> hit you. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. And like I said, I can ramble about Stephen King for just yeah. for, for days on end. Days on end. Um, yeah. So, yeah, thank you for this opportunity. I'm, I'm really, I'm having fun with this. Yes, I'm very excited. And I think our first episode is really good. And everybody can check me out at the Super Network at supermarcy.com. And you can find all my socials in the show description or show notes. And if you want to contact me personally, I'm on Twitter at supermarcy.com and letterboxd at super underscore marcy. And until next time, I'm avoiding Chapel Wait and Jerusalem's lot and snowstorms <laughs> in the middle of summer. <laughs> I think you'll be lucky with the snowstorms here and all. Yeah. Hopefully no vampires. So <laughs> <laughs> catch you later, everybody. Bye.